People love to complain about their commutes, but unless you live in one metropolitan area and travel to work in a completely different metropolitan area, you're still just a normal commuter. Today though, we're gonna talk about super commuters. People who literally drive, take transit, or even fly hundreds of miles to get to their job. And unfortunately, you're gonna see it's something that probably happens a lot more often than you think. Along the way, we'll talk about five of America's mega regions, how work-related travel has changed post-pandemic, and what it might mean for the future of intercity travel in the US. And I'm gonna play with a super interesting data source that I don't think I've used yet on this channel, and it's all coming up next. This is City Nerd, weekly content on cities and transportation. Viewer suggested topics always welcome, but this is one that just came from my own caffeine-addled brain. Because can I just say that last week's video, which kind of implies that housing in cities like Seattle, San Francisco, and DC is appropriately priced kind of left a bad taste in my mouth, so consider today's video penance for that if it makes you feel better. It's already making me feel better. Because super commuting these days is an unfortunate part of the housing affordability equation in a lot of our most in-demand cities. So first, let's define what we're talking about. Some people will define super commuting as when it takes you 90 minutes or more to get to your job, but honestly, that's just normal everyday life in Southern California. Instead, I like the definition that's laid out in the study that first really tackled this topic. It's from 2012, and it's The Emergence of the Super Commuter by Mitchell Moss and Carson King at NYU's Wagner School. The study defined as a super commuter any individual who lives beyond the census-defined combined statistical area of their workplace, and then it used the U.S. Census Longitudinal Employer Household Dynamics Origin Destination Employment Statistics, I promise I won't say that again, to identify just just how prevalent supercommuting was in the most recent data set that was available, which was 2009. It's actually an interesting read if you're a data nerd, so I'll link it down in the description. The study is from around the time of the financial crisis, and a lot has changed in the world since then. Housing has gotten a lot more expensive, especially in coastal cities, which pushes people to make tougher decisions about where to live and how long they're willing to commute. And the pandemic changed things too. A lot more people either work from home or have some kind of hybrid schedule where they might only have to physically show up at work a couple times a week or maybe even a few times a month. And I'm just going to say, I really don't feel like we should be designing our cities or our transportation systems to accommodate people who commute between metro areas. But for some people, given what housing prices are in the places that have the best job opportunities, living in a completely different urban area can actually be a rational choice. And unfortunately, until we figure out how to increase the supply of housing in the high demand cities, we really have to think about the choices people are actually making and what their actual travel behavior is. So today I'm doing my own version of the study with the same data source, but with the most recent numbers which are from 2021. Incidentally, all the data is available in the census web-based tool called On the Map, and the interface <laughs> apparently hasn't been updated since I started using it around the time of the NYU study. But I'm going to take a little different approach from what they used. Instead of of analyzing a central county and defining super commuters as people who work there but come from outside the county's combined statistical area, I'm going to simplify it a bit. I'm going to take all primary jobs within a metropolitan statistical area and analyze how many workers are coming from outside the metro area to work those jobs and where they're coming from. This isn't perfect, but a lot of the commutes that were left out of the NYU study, like San Bernardino to downtown LA, are pretty horrific. And I want to know how many people are doing that. Now note that technically you could live in Chino, which is part of the Inland Empire MSA, and walk across the county line to your job as a like, badminton instructor in Pomona, which is part of the Los Angeles MSA, and by my definition that would be a super commute. But I'm going to go out on a limb and say that that is quite literally an edge case, and typical commutes between these two metro areas are going to be much, much worse. That is the setup, so let's get into the five mega regions I want to talk about. And first let's hit the megalopolis. And I want to start with New York, the metro area with the most jobs in the US. Over 90% of the people who work in the New York metro area live there as well, which is a high percentage for the cities we're looking at today. And the number one external metro area people commute from is Philadelphia. And the data say around 135,000 people are doing just that. Let's math it out real quick. The Northeast Regional takes about 90 minutes each way 
so let's say you're spending maybe two extra hours commuting compared to what you would if you lived in New York. So like 40 hours a month. You're probably saving at least $2,000 a month on rent in Philly and spending maybe $600 on train fares if you go into work 20 days a month. So if you're taking the train where you can probably get work done or whatever else you want and you place your value of time at around $30 an hour or less, then super commuting from Philly starts to make a lot of sense. DC, about 18% of workers come from outside the DMV, including about 190,000 from the number one external origin, Baltimore. That's going to be a cheaper and easier commute than New York Philly, and the delta in housing costs probably makes a lot of those commutes pencil out. Boston, we talked about how high the rents are last week, so it should come as no surprise that about 20% of workers come from outside Greater Boston, over 100,000 each from Worcester and Providence. I'll come back and talk a bit more about Boston later. Okay, so the Northeast Megalopolis sets kind of a baseline. Now let's get into some regions that have, in my opinion, even more interesting regional dynamics. If you've never seen the Regional Plan Association's map of the U.S. mega regions before, it is interesting. And it's integral to a lot of the thinking that's been done about high-speed rail at the federal level. Anyway, I want to talk about Florida, but not the whole Florida mega region, because the data say that all the really interesting stuff is happening around Tampa, St. Pete, and Orlando. Around 23% of workers in Tampa St. Pete come from adjacent metro areas, and over 30% of Orlando workers do. There's a whole commute shed running from the Gulf Coast to the Atlantic Coast, and it includes Lakeland slash Winter Haven, which is its own metro area of 800,000 or so, halfway between Tampa and Orlando. Note that unlike the Northeast Corridor, this is probably close to 100% driving trips today, so you can see how the commute pattern data really helps make the argument for the Tampa Bright line extension, which we could see as early as 2028, but didn't get selected for funding in the round of high-speed rail grants that came out earlier this month. By the way, Tampa St. Pete, I'll be out your way in January, so let me know what you want to see in a video. Let's go somewhere even more confusing, the Bay Area. Only 68% of workers in the San Francisco-Oakland metro actually live there, and only 58% of the workers in the San Jose metro. Now, a lot of this is commuting between the two areas, the centers of which are around 50 miles apart, and it's maybe not awful if you can take Caltrain or BART, but a decent number of commuters are also coming from Sacramento or even places like Stockton, and around 100,000 total from LA, if you can believe it. It. As always on this channel, everything just seems to come back to housing affordability. Like, you have to live in Stockton and spend hours of your life commuting every day so that homeowners in the Bay Area can maintain the housing scarcity that keeps their property values high. Okay, in a minute I'm going to get to what I think are the two most interesting mega regions when it comes to super commuting, as well as some closing thoughts on what all this means for housing affordability in our highest demand cities. But first, a brief reminder to click on all this stuff. I'm actually going to take next Wednesday off for the holidays, but I'll probably do like an end of year live stream just so you don't miss out on your weekly morphine drip of poorly produced urbanism content. Date and time, TBD, but if you hit the bell, you should get notified when I post on the community tab and set up the landing page for the live stream. I'll put word out on the apps too, as well as on Patreon, where I post longer form thoughts at least once a week. Okay, I lied. I've got a sixth mega region I want to touch on briefly, just because I can't go a whole video without talking about Chicago, can I? There's actually surprisingly little commuting into Chicago from other metro areas. 30,000 from Rockford and like 17,000 from St. Louis, which is a lot of people, just not compared to anything else we're talking about today. Actually, really surprising to me that there's so little commuting from the Milwaukee metro area, considering how close it is and the fact that you've got a decent rail connection. Maybe, I don't know, people can actually afford to live in Chicago? Let's talk about the Texas Triangle now because it is so interesting. Four cities, Dallas, Houston, Austin, and San Antonio. And for each of the four, the other three cities are the top three origins for external commuting trips. When you look at the dynamics, it actually starts to imply the gravity model stuff I do in my high-speed rail videos. In other words, the bigger the cities are and the closer they are together, the more travel there is between them. And with a very basic gravity model, you're going to get identical flows between 
between the cities, but the dynamics around employment opportunities and housing prices are a lot more complicated than that. If you watched last week's video, you know Austin has the highest median incomes out of all these cities, but also the highest housing prices. So for example, you get a lot more people commuting from San Antonio to Austin than you get in the other direction. Anyway, the commuting flows alone in the Texas Triangle practically seem like enough by themselves to justify Texas high-speed rail, let alone all the other different kinds of trips people make between all these cities. Just build it. All right, let's go to Southern California where there's just far too much going on. The NYU paper that I cited didn't want to call traveling between LA and the Inland Empire super commuting, but I just point out that if you want to drive from what I'd consider the epicenter of the Inland Empire, downtown San Bernardino, to downtown LA at say 6 a.m. on a weekday, you better plan on an hour 45 if you want to be on time to your job. Or if you're lucky enough to live right at the San Bernardino Metrolink station, the train is going to take you an hour 40 to get you into LA Union Station. That's longer than the Northeast regional trip from Philly to New York City without anything even in the ballpark of the transit connectivity you get at Penn Station. So yeah, I'm going to call that a super commute, although it's super in exactly the wrong way. Here's the part that blows my mind. Nearly half a million people have their primary job in the LA metro area but live in the Inland Empire half a million workers. The caveat is, again, it's theoretically possible that this can be a walking trip, but for the vast majority, this is going to be a soul-destroying drive. Is it worth it? I don't know. It just depends how you assess the trade-off between saving a couple hundred dollars a month on housing and spending a lot more on driving, not only in terms of gas and depreciation, but in terms of how much of your life it sucks away from you and your sanity. The commute flows between LA and San Diego really get overshadowed here, but that's a big number too. You know, the Office of Management and Budget has specific criteria they use to define metropolitan statistical areas based on these kinds of commute flows. And the extent to which all of Southern California is really just one big metropolitan area is really interesting to me. Maybe not interesting enough to make a video about. We'll see. Finally, let's go back to Boston. I talked last week about how insanely high the rents are relative to the median income, which is above average, but not anything like, say, the Bay Area. Well, one thing I wanted to look at was, are there locations where there's at least twice as much super commuting in one direction as there is in the other? Because that would really indicate a place where people are trying to take advantage of a hot job market in one place while they economize on housing in another. And city pairs like New York and Philly and LA and the Inland and Empire are interesting but don't quite get there. The two big pairs that actually met this criteria were Worcester, Boston, and Providence, Boston. So if you're looking for a couple more data points to tell you that there's a serious housing supply issue in our highest demand cities, I think the fact that people are sacrificing thousands of hours of their lives and traveling thousands of extra miles every year by whatever mode just to be able to afford to live is probably sufficient. And sure it's better if those trips are happening on a train. I enjoy train travel. Just kind of enjoy travel, period. And I am always looking for ways to organize and simplify when I'm going on a visit to another city, and that's where today's sponsor, Bellroy, comes in. Bellroy began in 2010 designing wallets that are slim and efficient and prioritize access to the items you use the most. And since then, they've branched out to bags, accessories, phone cases, all kinds of useful everyday stuff that stay true to the company's original design philosophy. But the item I'm currently enamored with is their tech organizer. If you're like me, when you travel, you've got all kinds of cords, adapters, earbuds, power banks, mice, and all of it invariably ends up jumbled in your backpack. The tech kit solved this for me once and for all to the point where I'd just keep it on my desk with everything in its place, even when I'm not traveling. Oh, and I have to mention, Bellroy is a certified B Corp, which means they meet high standards for sustainability and social good. And that includes the fact that they've upcycled over 10 million plastic water bottles and hundreds of thousands of pounds of industrial nylon offcuts to make their goods, including the tech kit, which is made from recycled woven fabric. So with Bellroy, you can get a great item that you'll feel good about. And if you use my custom link down in the description, you can get 10% off anything on their site. So just go treat yourself. And that's all I got. 
Thanks for joining today, and thanks as always to the patrons who keep things rolling along steadily, maybe even making it possible for me to take the occasional Wednesday off, which I am doing next week. Again, hit the notification bell and follow on the apps if you're interested in joining for an end of your live stream topic TBD. Keep the great topic suggestions coming. I'll be back with a new episode in two weeks, and I'll see you then.